Hi everyone, it's our Thursday TNT. Thank you for tuning in as we whip around the main stories from around Thailand. Thank you to those people that have subscribed and on your way out, if you'd just like to click that like button on the way out, that'd be great. Uh, so we'll start today with a bit of lost nuclear fissionable material. Nothing really. And Thai PBS World says they're still searching for missing cesium-137 intensifies public health officials on standby. Well, you really wouldn't want to be coming across that, would you? Let's find out a bit more. Local officials and those from Thailand's Office of Atoms for Peace have launched searches for a canister of radioactive cesium-137, which has gone missing from a steam power plant in Prachanburi. We'll find out where Prachanburi is in just a moment. How it's been lost, we're not quite sure. But, oh, whoops, I think I've lost some fissionable material. Meanwhile, a 50,000 baht reward has been offered by the National Power Plant 5A company, which operates the power plant for information that leads to the recovery of the radioactive material contained in a steel tube about two inches in diameter, eight inches long and weighing about 25 kilograms. Mixing our metric and our imperial, a representative of the company said that they discovered that the radioactive material was missing during a routine check on March the 10th and has filed a complaint with the local police. I would have loved to have seen the policeman's face when you received that phone call. Let's find out where Prachanburi is. And so it's just east of Bangkok, between Bangkok and the uh, the Cambodian border. So that's where this power plant is. And uh, was it stolen? Was it misplaced? Let's try and find out a bit more. Officials equipped with radiation detectors searched a number of scrap shops in the district. Probably something that the scrap shop owners hadn't seen a lot of as well. And the Permanent Secretary of the Public Health Ministry said that brief exposure to the radioactive material will not have much effect on health, but prolonged exposure is harmful to the body. So we'll keep an eye on that story and uh, see if we can find out exactly what happened to it. A bit of a mystery there. Our next story once again from Thai PBS World. Tense armed standoff in Bangkok ends with police storming the house and firing tear gas and rubber bullets. Special operations officers stormed a house in the uh, Bangkok Sai Mai district to subdue an armed police officer and end a tense 27-hour armed standoff which began on Tuesday morning. The police officer has been identified as Police Lieutenant Colonel Kitty Khan and he sustained serious injuries during the operation at about 12.10 uh, p.m. A police officer from the 2nd Division of the Metro Police Bureau told the media that Kitty Khan could not speak to police yet because he was very weak, having not eaten or slept for two days. He disclosed that Kitty Khan was in the middle of the process of being transferred to another division because of his psychiatric problems, which may stem from stress at work or at home. He said, however, that Kitty Khan might have lost control after doctors at the police general hospital were about to send him for a psychiatric assessment And then a bit further down, it says that about 60 bullet casings were found. Let's try and find some more reporting on this story. We go to Coconuts, Bangkok, which is at coconuts.co. And their headline is, Standoff with Violent Bangkok Cop Ends After 25 Hours. And after a standoff lasting over 25 hours, reported as 27 hours in Thai PBS, Bangkok police finally apprehended a disgruntled cop who had barricaded himself inside his home and opened fire on those that came near. And there were unconfirmed reports, says Coconuts.co, that several officers sustained injuries during the shootout. One officer was shot in the head, but was saved by his helmet. And Kitty Khan, who works in the Intelligence Development Centre for the Special Branch Bureau, was quickly taken to a police vehicle and transported to the Pumipon Hospital for treatment. Well, exactly what set him off, uh, we're not sure yet, but if some more information comes out about that, we'll pass it on. Now, thanks for joining in, by the way, on our Thursday program. On Saturday, we've got uh, the live program, just myself and you this week, uh, and a couple of something that you like. Uh, anybody can join in, so that's on Saturday morning at 9am Thai time. And then on Sunday, we've got our next edition of Grumpy Old Men.
So thanks, of course, to our sponsor, Five Star Marine. If you'd like to go out on a premium private charter anywhere off the island of Phuket to some of the 32 islands offshore, then uh, make sure you contact Five Star Marine uh, and make an inquiry or a booking. There's a link in the description under this video. And we're actually doing a whole five-day trip out uh, around the islands of Phuket. And that I think will be happening the week after next. So that should be fun going for a bit of island hopping. And you'll be coming with me too. To our next story today, and Thailand's days of cannabis free-for-all are numbered. This story by Phuket Go, uh, Phuket-Go.com. And it talks about the core issue as Thais prepare to go to the polls for a May general election is that only one of the political parties supports the status quo, and that's Bum Jai Tai, the original authors of the decriminalisation last year, amidst opposition to recreational use of cannabis from all other political parties. The article says it's unlikely that there's a future for Thailand's current reputation as Asia's Amsterdam. So yes, there is a, an election coming up. The parliament will be dissolved in the next week or so. And everybody's going to be talking about this particular issue. And uh, the parties are starting to line up now, indicating what their particular stance on recreational use of cannabis is going to be. The article goes on to say, politically, Bum Jai Tai would have to double its current numbers of MPs to be a strong enough voice in new coalition government. And uh, it says that that's unlikely. So let's go through some of the parties and what their current stance is. The Pur Thai Party, the political party most likely to attract the largest number of primary votes, has taken a strict stance against recreational cannabis use, with its deputy leader stating that the party plans to restrict the use of marijuana to medical and research purposes only. He says that if the Pur Thai forms the next government, it will take charge of the public health ministry, clamp down on the current recreational use free for all. It will be interesting to see exactly how they might try and do that and if there's going to be any compensation. We'll get to that a bit later. On the other hand, the Bum Jai Thai Party, which currently oversees the Public Health Ministry. Well, the Public Health Minister is Anatan Shah Virakun, and he's one of the Deputy Prime Ministers. And they've made the legalisation of marijuana its core election policy. Now, the Democrat Party, which usually gets the third or the fourth highest number of votes, certainly dropped in popularity since the early 2000s. Let's see what they've got to say. They're supportive of medical marijuana, but not free trade in the herb or recreational use. And a party MP says that the current legal vacuum has created ripe conditions for exploitation of the marijuana market. Uh, in his opinion, the party should prepare three new bills. So this is an interesting approach. One for medical marijuana, another for the use of hemp, and a third for the use of marijuana for non-medical purposes. And then he suggests letting the public debate the last bill and the next government take the lead from the result of any debate. So are they going to have a public plenary? Are they going to have an open public debate? Is it just going to be a vote in Parliament? Again, it comes down to exactly how they're going to not only decide on, on that particular issue, but then uh, enforce it. Now, moving forward to the Move Forward Party, Thailand's most progressive party, the article says, and an offshoot of the now disbanded Future Forward Party, uh, believes that cannabis should be relisted as a narcotic. According to their leader, he thinks the public should still be able to access marijuana's benefits through certain laws that limit the herb's use. However, he says cannabis should definitely be categorised as a narcotic to protect members of the public. So they're taking a pretty hardline stance against uh, the recreational use of cannabis. And the article says that many people have set up retail businesses and even invested large amounts in new plantations on the false assumption that all uses of cannabis were now legal in Thailand since last year's June 9 delisting of cannabis as a Category 5 narcotic. So were these people that invested in a retail shop, they invested in a, a plantation, were they actually misled into believing that they could do that legally or did they just make some assumptions? Uh, I think this is going to be a very vexed question and if there is a recriminalisation of the 
recreational use of cannabis. Uh, how is the Thai government going to cope with perhaps uh, the compensation for some of these people after spending so much money? But even if we have an election in May, it's going to be at least August or September until any new cannabis law can get into Parliament. So the current situation is going to continue for at least most of the rest of this year, as far as I can see. And that report from uh, Phuket-go.com. We move on to our next story today, if I can get this machine working. Thailand approves extradition deal with Russia as Russians flood in. This story being reported by The Star. And it was also reported in the Nation and the Asia News Network. The cabinet approved a draft extradition treaty with Russia last Tuesday amid reports that Russians are flocking to Thailand to avoid fallout from the war in Ukraine. And the article goes on to say the treaty would boost collaboration to suppress crime, according to the government spokesperson, adding that the details match extradition agreements Thailand has with other countries. And it goes on to say that the extradition deal does not need Parliament's approval since it doesn't affect Thailand's territory, economy, society or trade and investment just as well because they haven't been able to pull a quorum together in the Thai Parliament for at least two or three months. The article goes on to claim that tens of thousands of Russians hoping to avoid conscription and the economic fallout of war with Ukraine have visited Thailand since the invasion in February last year, according to Al Jazeera. And that article reported that many are looking to move to the kingdom permanently, citing data showing Russians bought nearly 40% of condos sold to foreigners in Phuket last year. Well, a few things to say about that. As far as the 40% of condos sold to foreigners were sold to Russians. Uh, the, we're talking about the available condos that were available to foreigners and that were available at the time. It's not saying that 40% of all condos in Phuket uh, have been sold to Russians. And then the other claim there that tens of thousands of Russians are hoping to avoid conscription. As far as I can see, a lot of the Russian people walking around are young families. And a lot of the international schools are saying, yes, uh, they're booked out with a lot of young Russian students. So I think uh, it's quite a broad range of people arriving from Russia at the moment for either a holiday or, as the article suggests, for a longer term stay. Let's go to our next story now. And the Bangkok Post reporting the NEB bans burning across the north. Who's the NEB? The NEB is the National Environment Bureau. And they said yesterday that they're backing stronger measures to deal with air pollution from fine particle matter, smaller than 2.5 microns, which is the PM2.5 that we keep on talking about. It ordered all 17 provinces in the north to cease burning activities until the end of April. Does the National Environment Board have any teeth or the ability to enforce this? I don't know. So a spokesperson from the Centre for Air Pollution Mitigation at the Department of Pollution Control said the level of PM2.5 had reached as high as 225 micrograms per cubic metre in some spots earlier this month. Have we seen the worst of the air pollution? And the NEB has come up with plans to deal with the PM2.5 pollution, including enforcing zero burning policy in both forest and agricultural zones in the 17 northern provinces. Additional forest parks will be ordered to close if the situation worsens, which could see at least 92 forest zones operating under the Department of National Parks, Wildlife and Plant Conservation closed. And other measures adopted by the NEB include prohibiting purchases of sugarcane harvested by burning methods, limiting the number of trucks permitted to enter urban zones, and measures to make artificial rain, and a plan to set up PM 2.5 free spaces. Well, making artificial rain here in Thailand seems to have been both ineffective and fairly unreliable. As far as setting up 2.5 PM 2.5 free spaces, unless you're in a room with uh, an air conditioner and an air filter, I don't really know how they're going to do that. But uh, let's go on. They're also going to set up a pollution clinic, which will be set up in high-risk areas. 
Okay, whatever. I, I think the situation still here is, I mean, obviously they, they have got some ideas and uh, most of them, well, as far as uh, prohibiting purchases of sugarcane harvested by burning methods, and limiting the number of trucks permitted to enter urban zones. I mean, they're sort of positive things that could be done, but they have to be enforced. The Thai government's going to have to throw some resources into enforcing these ideas. I'm not even sure if the National Environment Board has got the teeth to be able to administer this. But uh, at least it's a move forward. But again, here we are in halfway through March and they're talking about proposals and the burning season will be over in the next month or so. And then nothing will happen and it'll all happen again next year and I'll be talking about the same stories. Just finally, they said the main source of PM 2.5 smog in the capital is from burning activities outside the city. I've been banging on about that for the last three or four years. He said it was essential to control activities in the agricultural sector to make Bangkok's air more breathable again. This is the fire map this morning, Thursday morning at around about uh, eight o'clock in the morning. Thai time and as usual you can see it's not so much Thailand it's uh, the areas around Thailand you've got uh, Laos there Cambodia and Myanmar within Thailand itself certainly a lot less active fires than uh, in the surrounding areas so no matter what the National Environment Board or anybody else does within Thailand the work has to be between the governments in these border areas around Thailand. And just looking at the PM 2.5 situation today, and it's, again, very, very bad up in the north, and it's a little bit better around Bangkok and central Thailand, northeastern Thailand, not looking too bad today, but still very high or too high. And you can see that the further south you go, the, uh, the way the air improves, and we've even got green areas around Nakhon Si Tamarat there, so at least some acknowledgement over the past few weeks that these plantation fires are the major cause of the smoke and the smog this time of the year. And also some ideas coming out and some proposals. But actually getting those proposals turned into something that can be enforced is part of the problem. And then as we can see from all the evidence that they need to get together with the government's around the borders of Thailand if they're going to properly tackle this problem long term. And places like Chiang Mai, which rely so much on tourism, I mean, it's very difficult for them for three or four months of the year to say, come to beautiful Chiang Mai, uh, echo tourism, what a beautiful place, and it is. Come and stand on our beautiful mountains and enjoy the sweeping views. Where well, all you can see is about 100 metres in front of you. Now, obviously, it needs to be solved. And with that, I thank you very much for dropping in today. We'll be back again with another 15-minute program tomorrow as we whip around Thailand and the main news stories. And then on Saturday, we've got our live show. It goes for about an hour, starts at 9 a.m. Thai time. And on Sunday, the latest edition of Grumpy Old Men. See you tomorrow.